In a sunny day on July 2017, I drove my car down Interstate 35 to move to Texas A&M University as a faculty member. Only a few weeks later, Hurricane Harvey ravaged Texas and dumped more than 50 inches of rain in some parts of Houston, flooded thousands of properties, and led to the largest number of direct deaths from a hurricane in Texas since 1919. The damage that Hurricane Harvey caused was nothing like what we had seen before. Harvey damaged more than $125 billion worth of assets in Texas, making it the second most costly hurricane in the U.S. mainland since 1900. In fact, the number, intensity, and frequency of water-related events have been on the rise in the past few decades. In the U.S., 90% of all disasters involve a flood. And in some parts of the country, almost all residential neighborhoods, road network, and major infrastructure are vulnerable to flood risk. The fast pace of urbanization and migration of population has made it extremely difficult to rely on conventional methods of data collection when it comes to flood risk mapping. Take the example of FEMA flood maps. These maps cover only a small portion of U.S. streams and shorelines, and by design they are not intended to take into account urban flooding as a result of intense rainfall, a phenomenon that we observe increasingly as the atmosphere warms up. So part of how we as people recognize and communicate the risk of flood has to do with our past experience and exposure to similar events. But not all of us have seen a major flood event in our lifetime. As humans, we develop comprehensive awareness of our environment using our senses. But we also tend to underestimate the environmental risk in our places of living and work. Numbers show that the leading cause of direct death in a flood event is due to drownings. In Hurricane Harvey, for example, 80% of people who lost their lives attempted to drive their vehicle through flooded roads and standing water. So, so what is it about this that makes the quantification and understanding of flood risk so difficult? It turns out that a lot of people move all the time, either voluntarily or because they have to. The latest US Census data showed that in a span of 10 years, between 2010 and 2020, the population of Texas grew by 4 million people, the largest of any state in the country. California, in the 19 years of the past 20 years, ranked as the number one move to Texas state. But there are many more people who come to Texas from all over the country. So it is not unrealistic to think that at any given time in the state of Texas, there is a large population who has not seen or experienced any flood events in their lifetime. So here is my first question that I ask myself. How do we communicate the flood risk with something that we can access to on a daily basis? I want you to think about your daily routines in your neighborhoods and local streets. Some of you walk from your place of living to the place of work and vice versa. Some of you run, bike, or jog in your neighborhoods. What is the number one object in the built environment that you guys pay attention to as you're doing these activities? Some of you may think, well, my phone. Well, that's a perfectly legitimate answer. But I would argue that if you pay close attention to the road in front of you, traffic signs are very difficult to miss. Did you guys know that there are 500 federally approved types of traffic signs in the US? And 78% of these signs, according to research, are perfectly recognizable by all people, regardless of age or group. Among all signs, my favorite is a stop sign. And that's because it is very difficult to miss this sign. It's a big red octagonal shape with the word stop in the middle. So, if you go around your neighborhood, you probably see a lot of these stop signs, right? In the US, in local uh, residents and local neighborhoods, these stop signs measure 30 inches wide by 30 inches high. So here comes my next question. Can photos of stop signs be used to estimate flood water depth in our streets? To pursue this question, I put together a team of multidisciplinary researchers from construction science where I am from, urban sciences, and geosciences. And we submitted a research proposal to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration under the Texas Sea Grant program. The idea was simple. If, as humans, we can take a look at a photo of a submerged stop sign and estimate the flood water, the depth of the water in that location, 
then perhaps we can train a computer model using artificial intelligence to do the same, but with higher speed and more accuracy. So here is how our AR algorithm works. We provide the algorithm with a photo of a submerged stop sign. The algorithm tries to find the red octagonal shape of the sign, and then right below that shape, it looks for an object that resembles the pole on which the sign is mounted. Because the sign is 30 inches high, we can use mathematical proportions to find out how much of the pole is visible to the algorithm. That is, how much of the pole is above the waterline. Now, if we know where this photo was taken, we can send out somebody to that location, or even better, we can use an online mapping system to capture a flood free view of that same stop sign. Then, we feed that flood free view to the algorithm. The algorithm finds the stop sign again, and this time right below the stop sign, it finds the entire pole that the stop sign is mounted on. If we compare the length of the same pole, pre-flood and post-flood, the difference is a good approximation of how much flood we have in that area. So now imagine if this can be done for hundreds and thousands of local streets and neighborhoods. The tool will allow us to document, but also visualize, the extent of flood and the depth of flood water. Ordinary people and residents from these communities can help us increase the size of our database by uploading their own photos. To make this happen, in 2020, we developed our crowdsourcing application called BluePix. This is a free application available to the public that we developed as part of our NOAA-funded research grant. Currently, the app contains 300 photos of submerged stop signs from North America. And these photos are paired with their pre-flood photos and pinned to the map. We allow people to use their phones and smart devices to take photos of submerged stop signs in their neighborhoods and put them on the map. And also, if somebody else puts a photo on the map, another person can go and pair that photo with a pre-flood photo of the stop sign. So this is a true example of citizen science. In the background, the AI model compares pre-flood and post-flood photos of the same stop sign and determines the depth of the flood water. Once that depth information is available, it is displayed on the app so users can navigate in space and time and find out how much water exists in their vicinity, in their surrounding, in the past. So the true impact of this project in the long term is that it allows us to collect as many flood photos as possible from local streets and neighborhoods, something that was impossible before at a large scale. We can share this information through artificial intelligence technology and crowdsourcing with the general public to help them understand how floodwaters have historically moved in their neighborhoods, blocked roads, or damaged properties. But in addition to the technical reach and, and availability of this application, I think the most important aspect of this work is that it helps build trust between communities and authorities. Because we provide communities with creative and new ways so that they can become citizen scientists and help us in developing policies and decisions regarding flood mitigation and management. Thank you. <laughs>